Where are all my friends? Sitting down with David Teitelbaum. Yo. And for the listeners, yes, I spent five minutes before we started this making sure that I said Teitelbaum right. Title, title bomb, title bomb, title bomb, title, title bomb, title, title bomb, title, 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 The idea behind it was to sit down with some of the more inspiring entrepreneurial people who have gone down alternative paths, not necessarily a nine to five, but people who are doing something creative, something inspiring. And I think there's a lot more than just music in that category. So you are the owner and main man behind the brand Rose in Good Faith, which is doing something that I consider to be really cool. just as far as all things fashion. And I'll let you kind of give the the better recap. But to me, it's special because I want to hear stories from people outside of just the music industry. And I'm really honored to have someone like yourself down to share your story and to tell that side of it. I think there's a very similar glue that keeps these creatives together and inspires people like that. So I love these stories. So thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, so with that said, for anybody who doesn't know who you are or isn't familiar with the brand, give me the the quick explanation of what it is, what you do, that. Yeah, we're in the space right between avant-garde, high fashion and streetwear, and it comes in with this music element. So it's culture. It's this amalgamation of culture. Yeah. And um, as the brand's been growing, we've been growing. So we've, we're in five different stores all over the world. Everything's pretty much... Um, uh, Korea, Japan, um, B- Berlin. We're at, in the store in Moscow. Um, just enjoying, enjoying the journey. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, it's cool, and I think you said that really well because what did draw me to it, and I was thinking about this before it started. I cannot remember how we met, but when we met, what drew me to it was there was influences in the brand, very. Uh, very directly related to culture and music and things more than just high fashion. So I thought that was really cool. Do you remember how we met? We met at Machine Gun Kelly's birthday party, which was the wildest freaking party. Oh. There was like Marilyn Manson talking to Tommy Lee. Oh. Yo, that party was Dude, wild. I remember, I always, I think back to that night and I'm like, that's the night that I saw Marilyn Manson casually having fun. Yeah. I never thought that I would tell <laughs> young right? Andrew, like, dude, you saw Marilyn Manson having fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was wild. I took so many photos of him. Dude, that, was, that is where we met. Damn it. Yeah. That was a cool night. Yeah. Holy. That was a wild night. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, and uh, just again, to paint the picture of the brand, it, it is really cool. Like it's grown to be something bigger than most brands already. Like you've had a lot of really cool looks. You've had a lot of big celebrities wear it. Um, I mean, like what, like Billie Eilish, Ariana Grande, the Kardashians, Lil Nas X, like that's big names. That's not just like, oh, cool. Somebody from this band wore this. Like it's in culture. Yeah. You've had a lot of big features, like uh, a lot of press, right? Like you had an article in Forbes. In Forbes. So you're, you're in Forbes, but then you're right. also High Snob Society, Hype Beast. Yeah, Hype like, Beast, Maxim, Ben and Playboy, um, ID Magazine, Vice, uh, anything cultural. Been yeah. A lot, I got a lot of cultural coverage. Exactly. Yeah. And then again, to tie that in, you've done a lot of really cool culturally relevant collabs, right? Like you've done stuff with Ed Hardy like at a very relevant time of bringing that back in a very cool way. Ghost main, like, bro, that's, I don't think it gets cooler than that. So there's been a lot of that, right? Yeah. And to me, again, why it's such an honor to have you is I really want to hear this story. And it's like, to me, like a brand that can pull things like that off. Like there is, there's a reason and there's smarts and there's strategy behind that. So this is going to be a fun one. Yeah. 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 I'm excited. Thank you. Thank you for being here. The way that I like to get started, and I really love hearing like your story, right? So where I love to start is somewhere 
where you first found your thing. I don't necessarily know like what age or wherever that is, but kind of finding whatever the beginning of this journey was, like where that is for you and how that started to look. Yeah. So it started in Phoenix, Arizona. I went to ASU, you know, the party capital. That's like a big party college. Yeah. Big party college. This eyebrow was shaved off by a stripper. I had like a mohawk. I like, I went in. I came from like a sheltered New Jersey home. Oh. And then I went to Arizona. It was just like party, party. Everyone fucking everybody. Wild, wild, wild. Joined a frat. Dude. Yeah. Wild. Damn. And then two years into it, I got really unhappy and started realizing everyone was very surface, very, very substance, not a lot of uh, ambition, not a lot of individuality. It was very cookie cutter people. So after the, you know, the fog of, the excitement wore off. I was really unhappy. And I used to stare at this poster of Manhattan in my bedroom. And I was just, I think one night I just started crying. And I was like, I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to leave school, but I don't want to be here anymore. So I just finished the semester, packed my shit, sold all my furniture, and then stayed on my friend's couch in Manhattan and just oh, left. Shit. So I was like, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not doing college. I'm just going to figure it out. Then I started trying to figure it out. And I worked at like bars and restaurants and trying to make enough money to get off this couch. Um, and I started fighting Muay Thai in the basement of a church in Manhattan. What? For like a year, a little bit over a year. What so, age? Um, 21. I was okay. 21. So then that's why I got like all these tattoos. Oh. Uh, yeah. So that was a part of your life, like finding Muay Thai and like... Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was cathartic. I mean that level of aggression and hostility in a controlled environment is like very cathartic. And I needed something to really like rattle and shake and find where, what do I want to do with my life? You yeah. Know, didn't have a college degree. Yeah. You know, living on the Upper East Side, barely making it. Yeah. Uh, working nights, working mornings, days, all of it. It's constantly jumping, 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 jumping. Just whatever job, like it, uh, jobs that don't really matter, but just like, something to pay rent. Functional. Yeah, yeah. Functional. Just like whatever can get me through. And I was seeing a creative arts therapist at the time. And she's like, you should just consider going to the new school, which is like a acclaimed fashion art school in New York. It's like the lesbian cousin of NYU. It's okay. like a feel goodery. It's like <laughs> everyone sits around in a circle. They talk about their feelings. It's like, yeah, it's that kind of a school. So I applied and I filled it out all the paperwork and I think like six months later I was about to fill up my I filled up my paperwork for the Marines so I was right about to go to the Marines damn like really unhappy at the so time. you were like legitimately just lost like looking lost. for anything anything I was like I was so unhappy so lost I was like if I need some purpose right now, I might as well just go do something for a country if that's going to do something for me that yeah. gives me something to do well rewind for a second because like clearly that like you, you took the step to go to New York, you're still lost, but even in college, like coming from New Jersey, super sheltered, going to college, living the crazy party life, clearly not connecting with that. Like you have your bit of it and you're like, okay, cool. This sucks enough to the point where you're looking at a poster of New York and you're like, all right, that, yeah. what was like, I mean, I'm surprised that even still getting to New York and I love talking about these things, you didn't have some instant aha moment. Like you still went from Arizona to New York, finding whatever you can, working whatever jobs, and you're still kind of going through it. So like, what was that like? Like, did you think there would be an aha moment going to New York? Did you, were you afraid of dropping out of college? Like, no, I was just so miserable that I would look for, I was looking for anything to get me out of it. Yeah. So I was just looking for survival. Like I was in mental survival mode. And like miserable, like, uh, in what way? Like, like, just lacking purpose, just yeah. yeah, just like existential misery. Yeah, where it's like, what's the point? Why am I doing this? Why do I have to do this? Here's what I want to do, but I can't make it work. I don't have the tools to make it work. You know, I also like for so long was told that I was, you know, dumb, like yeah. by my parents, by school, which is why I went to Arizona in the oh. first place, is that I was told constantly, and I started believing the bullshit I was told, which is everyone would tell me I was dumb and I was slow and didn't do well in school. So I fell out the Marine paperwork. Yeah. And 
I go to open up my mailbox because I'm going to drop off the paperwork, right? And I'm like, maybe let me just see if there's any mail here. Anything stop me? I was like, God, if there's a God, stop me from going to war. This is 20... 2009, this is 2009. Oh. Um, yeah, they're still, they're on second tour. Yeah. Um, so I'm like, something's, you know, if there's a guy out there, show me, give me a sign. Yeah. Open my mailbox. And there's an acceptance letter from the new school. So I'm like, no way, dude. Yeah. So I'm like, maybe, okay, maybe my atheistic tendencies are, I'm going to hold off for a second, just say like, maybe and yeah. see what happens. Yeah. So I went to this art school for two and a half years and learned fashion but also learned screenwriting and i wrote i have like a strong tenacity to just do and do and do and do and do yeah so i wrote 14 movies and two tv shows what the fuck and while i was at in college and i would just sit and just write just write i just had a lot to say at the time and i had a very creative way of getting it to studios so I would call and I knew that you couldn't send scripts unsolicited. You had to have a lawyer or an agent or somebody send it in. So I called and said that I'm a lawyer. I created a fake company saying that I'm like this law firm and my client sold Damn. these scripts and I sent it to MGM, one of my scripts. That's your last name working for you there, Yo, right there. <laughs> That's a lawyer ass <laughs> last name. I like that. <laughs> Title bound. Yeah. Yeah. So I love storytelling and I wrote this TV show about the Chinatown gang wars of 1901, New York called Doyer Street. Okay. And MGM picked it up what? right out of college. I picked it up. So I'm like, fuck you, New York. I'm out of here. So then I moved to LA and they found a place in Silver Lake. What age? Um, this was 2013. This was started in August 2013. So okay. I was like 24. Okay. 24. Dude. <laughs> So at that point, were you like, cool, I found my sense of purpose. I found my thing. Like, I just wrote all of this and I got picked up by MGM. Like, this is it. Yeah. Yeah. Momentarily. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's amazing. Okay, cool. So you're, fr you're fresh out of that college. Right. Move to LA. Get a spot in Silver Lake. Right. Had a script. Moving through. I'm writing episodes and I'm on the 10th episode and I'm there for six months and I'm still not happy. Right. Like there's an idea of what living in New York and a G idea of what living in LA is supposed to look like. Yeah. And I was just very alone. Like I didn't really have a lot of people around me. Yeah. I had a lot of thoughts and a lot of ideas, but just like I was still kind of, you know, missing and jonesing for New York. I had a lot of friends. The structure there is you just go out, you meet people, it's fun. LA, you have to know where you're going. And I so um with the script. They decided to, like six months into it, they bought it out, paid for everything. And they said, we're not going to go with this anymore. There's a, there was a whole Chinese, because the whole show was based upon Chinese gangs fighting. Um, and that was right when China was coming into the Hollywood system, which is why it really got picked up in the first place. Uh -huh. And then it show, slowly started to prove unsuccessful and that it wasn't really, it was more like a drop in the bucket. Then it was actually going to change the Hollywood system. I see. So they went with the show Vikings instead, which is why <laughs> now you see Vikings. On TV. <laughs> yeah. Damn. Wait, yeah. and it's, it's, it's just a question there. What was a day in the life like at that point? Like when that is your job and your hustle and your writing, like what does that look like? Because I have no idea. Yeah. Wake up at like, 12. Okay. So right? your schedule is loose. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you wake up at 12. Yeah. And then it's an hour of getting yourself in a mindset yeah. of getting into your flow, getting into creative, just finding the thing, jumping around, talking, screaming, going outside your comfort zone, getting into your flow. Yeah. So you don't feel stuck in monotony and you can be present because you have to really create a lot of visuals in your mind and then play them out. And they have to feel real on paper and yeah. in someone else's mind. And it's very easy to get lost in the manufactured concept of what stories could look like and how they feel to you versus like the structure and foundation of story. Yeah. So like always balancing that was tricky. And then I would just sit and write and write and write and then take a break, go to Trader Joe's, get some food, come back, write, 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 and then read it, say all of it is a shit, go outside, smoke a bunch of cigarettes, come back in and be like, oh, I got to redo it again. That's really interesting to hear because I, as much as I don't know people in that industry as much, I've had a lot of friends that 
did a ton of YouTube content creation and like, you know, like the almost daily videos, things like that. Mm -hmm. And where it's easy from the outside to look at it and be like, dude, must be nice or, you know, anything. It just must be nice. You get to be a creative all day. Right. Well, then the reality is you always have to be on and you always have to get into this headspace where you're charismatic or funny or whatever. Mm -hmm. So as you're saying that to me, I'm like, damn, I didn't even think about that. But you had the same thing. Like it, you could yeah. look at it and be like, oh, it must be nice. You get to write all day, but you're like, you don't get it. Like I have to just write all day and I have to be on and try to have something be good. Right. It's really just trapped in your head. Yeah. Because you're, it's work. It's still yeah. work. So you have to produce and have to keep producing. And if you're in a bad headspace or you're doing something bad, then you have to qualify it. Why is it bad? Is it bad because my attention's over here? Is it because my attention's there? Is it because I suck? Is it because... I don't have anything powerful to say is because I'm too sheltered and I'm not experiencing life enough. Yeah. You know, so it gets like you really dig yourself in. That's nuts. Yeah. Okay. So interesting. Thank you for sharing that. That's, that's yeah. I was genuinely curious. There. <laughs> so, okay. So the show ends up not getting picked up. They buy out that up. contract uh, or they buy out the script. Buy out the scripts. Um, and at the time I was really getting into cycling, like bellow cycling. Oh, like okay. Racing track bikes. Yeah, yeah. And I would always, oh, I love cars, by the way. Oh, cool. so I I mean, love, me too. Oh yeah, my God. Right? Yes. And I would just look at cars all, you know, at night after writing and yeah. I would race my bike on the weekends. There's a track down in, I'm forgetting where. Wait, okay. So I, I mean, I recently broke my legs. So I haven't been able to ride, but I, before that, I, w- I would like to ride fixed gear. Yeah. So just single speed road bikes, all that. Yeah. I think in real, real racing, don't they train on fixed gears, but then not actually race fixed gears? Well, I did like the Velo. So it was a fixed gear bike okay. in a track that had, you know, the ramps. So you're just like going around. Okay. Indoor yeah. Track. Yeah. Yeah. On like a very heavy gear. Cause like one of the jobs that I had when I was in New York was fixing bikes. Oh. So, the, so I got like very comfortable around the mechanics of bikes. Oh, okay. So I would like fix it, this Velo shop on. I forgot where somewhere in the East Village. Uh, maybe the word is is Velo a brand? I'm I'm missing on Velo. Um, or is it a type of? I'm also blanking. Okay, I think it's like um, Velocity is what it's short for. Oh, yeah. I mean, I had Velocity, Velocity wheels on my bike. That's a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. All right. Well, yeah. fair enough. Shows how how real we are in yeah, bike right? world. Yeah, I don't fucking know. People listening, they don't even know Velo Proper. Velo Proper. Jeez. Oh, fuck. Yeah, I'm out. So it rides super heavy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so you would actually go to a track, though. So I go to a track. Yeah, yeah. And I would race and go really fucking fast. And you go up the banks. And I mean, it's freedom. You're like, you're fucking yeah. free. Like you're yeah. flying on this bike. So after the show got taken out, um, I was really unhappy because I saw the future and the future didn't look good. Mm-hmm. It looked like I would be writing scripts, writing things I don't like, just sitting in a room and the idea of nothing happening for a year and a half, two years and not getting an idea made. Yeah. Made me freak out. Yeah. I was like, how is this sustainable? How do people do this? The delay and the, yeah. Oh my God. Like there's no... I love the art form of it, but when coming to the commerce of it, it's just like, I I met a few people in my journey while well, writing that were older than I was that were in their thirties and forties and had maybe one thing pop and that was it. And that their entire life was around that one thing and trying to reclaim that power or yeah. that presence. And like, it's not going to happen again. Yeah. So I'm like, this is not sustainable. This is not scalable. There's no way I can do this comfortably. Mm-hmm. So I was biking around so I went outside to just like smoke and chill and relax. Yeah. And I went to go. I'm like, fuck it. I'm going to go bike around Griffith Park. So I took my heavy ass bike, yeah. track bike around Griffith Park like yeah. an idiot. And I had a really heavy gear on. So braking was tough because it was fixed. So, you know, you break with your legs. Oh, yeah, dude. And it was like a track gear. And yeah. I'm like, oh, it's open pavement. I used to bike around Manhattan all the time. It's fine. And yeah. I biked in the first 10 minutes. I got hit by a car. No way. Went under a car. Oh, broke my scapula and my collarbone. Dude. Yeah. And I kind of think i did it to myself a little bit on purpose like i feel like i kind of put myself in that position a little bit because i'm so unhappy again damn yeah like rock bottom so unhappy because i'm like what am i gonna do with my life i found this thing i love but i can't do it yeah so um hospital stuck for six months with my arm just stuck and you know like how how shitty it is i was just there my dude yeah it sucks yeah 
And you said earlier in the story, that, or before I interrupted you, you were saying that you were also looking at cars or you're interested in cars. Does that tie into that? Just in general, that was okay. always the one moniker or beacon of success that I always yeah. looked at. Yeah. And value. Yeah. It was always cars. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. I yeah. wasn't sure if it would like tie back in. So, okay, so you're riding, you get hit by a car, go yeah. under a car, under rock a car. your side. Yeah, all fucked up. Yeah. No helmet. Just fine. Like, just a little scrape on my head. Well, that's huge. Like, lucky. Yeah. Probably would have, like, been kaput, Dude. you know, if you would. After yeah. That. And then you know what it's like when you just have to live with something that's so, you're so used to and so comfortable with. Yep. Like, walking. Like, your head. Dude. Right, uh, your head, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, like, upper, like, femur. But, yeah. yeah. So, just completely couldn't walk. Right. right. And you start saying, like, well, what is, you know, how do I live life? How, how I was so comfortable with this. What is normal? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it really, at least for me, the perspective that I saw was like, one, don't take things for granted. But two, like, just how much you take things for granted. Like, right. for me, it was like, wait a minute, I really do like my life and where things are at or liked before this stupid thing checked me and made me realize how much was just taken away. Mm -hmm. That was my perspective. Yeah. So what, what did you go through? Like, what did that during that time? This is how I found the Jewish thing. Oh. So in that time, yeah. I started, um, there was some serendipity asking around for help and doctors and using the Jewish card a lot and saying, hey, I'm Jewish, you know, like help me find a community, help me find a doctor. And I got hooked into it. Really? I was like orthodox, full on beard no way like i started getting really religious looking for the same thing which is like i was always looking for what is the purpose like what is give me give me the answer right like yeah i need to find what makes it easier to live Dude. Right? like and i thought these people had it you know i met these families that were so well put together and the kids were kind and generous and mannered and it just seemed like a unit every family i met felt like a unit and a community it was so welcoming and warm and everyone was successful and after my arm healed, I said, I'm unhappy. I don't want to write again. This is not going anywhere. So then I decided to go to yeshiva in Jerusalem. So I went to Israel for four months and studied the Torah in Israel. Dude. Jerusalem at Aish. That's crazy. But I like I do get it, right? Like I think yeah. a lot of people are looking for a sense of meaning and like you're painting this picture and I get it. Like I get what it's like. You just feel alone. You're looking for some kind of answer. You're looking for community. You're looking for principles to live off of. And it's a easier said than done thing sometimes. Yeah. It's like an idea of what it's supposed to look like and this expectation. And then when you're actually in it, it doesn't look that way. And you're like, what's wrong? Like, yes. It's not working here. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, I don't know if that's your expectation, right? Like if we paint a, a more grandiose picture than we should, you know, because you hear Los Angeles and you're like, that must be awesome. And this yeah. and this. And Entourage. Yeah. yeah. And then you're here. And like, I, I oftentimes have to remind myself. It's just like, no, like perspective. Right. Learn to not take things for granted or learn why you are and all these it's really interesting. Yeah. The I mean, pictures we paint. The pictures, right? And yeah. then like how they never, they'll never reach that yeah. like height. And yeah. if they do, your mind will never allow it. Yeah. You right. Know, find a way to, you know, change the perspective to say, well, now I want this. Right. Oftentimes right. you'll accomplish something and it's huge. It was all your goal ever was. But then as soon as it's done, as soon as it's accomplished, you're like, well, pff, that's not good enough. I wish right. now, because then you see what somebody else is doing and you're like, well, theirs is even better. Right. Oh, this that looks anything. so much better. Yeah. Yeah. I was talking to our advisor, my yeah. advisor, who's the creative director at Beats by Dre. Oh. And he was telling me that the CEO is like the poorest of all of his friends and they all have like G5 jets and he has like a G4 and they make fun of him for having a G4 and he feels like he's poor. And I'm yeah. Like, that blows my fucking mind to yeah. be that wealthy and feel like you're not that wealthy. Right. Just yeah, like there's insane. there's comparison everywhere. That's yeah. that's a lesson. And that's like I think that uh becoming comfortable with yourself and real security is comparing yourself against yourself and celebrating your victories and not because no matter like, dude, we're in LA, like right. any city, like you any anywhere you can find somebody that's the best of the best and it'll fuck with you. Yeah. So to continue on your story, so you go all the way out outside of LA, outside of the country, yeah, you're studying Judaism. 
continue you know, holy <laughs> in israel yeah with a big beard yeah um and the one thing that kept me from really diving into it is i love sex and porn <laughs> i and- love your honesty <laughs> this story is my favorite <laughs> and i was in this like bunk with all these dudes all the time yeah in jerusalem a lot of women were very aggressive and hostile or they were just like push away yeah because they you know it's a different culture everyone goes through the the military at 18 and i get it when you're walking around people look like they want to murder you yeah i've never seen somebody look at me like they did in israel like they wanted to murder me whoa anger just for me being in a present state in front just murder yeah they were like it's it's violent there man there's so many people getting stabbed and killed by cars and just like did you ever have any moments where you're like i'm about to die there were a few close moments um there was yeah there's this one the first weekend before well the first weekend that we were there there a war actually started it's like a civil war started to occur so um hamas kept launching these rockets overhead so every 20 minutes you hear the alarms go off and you have to go into a bomb shelter so they would shoot a, a rocket at the rocket and it would explode, but and you would just watch it, right? And it was wild. I'm Typical, like, yeah, that's what we do. We just watch I'm it. Everyone's so used to it. Yeah. As, as we all know. Yeah. Of and course. Yeah. Those are my moments when I'd be like, what's up, girl? What you doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'd be like, How you doing? We in the bomb shelter. Yeah, like, bomb what's shelter. Up? yeah. But my game did not work in Israel. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Bomb shelter game did not oh, work. Oh, bomb shelter game did not work. Sorry. Um, there was a stabbing right in front of our dorm. That's the end of the story the beginning yeah. of the story was we were gonna be there yeah and then this old woman popped out of like the gutter shadows and was like you guys shouldn't go back into the old city right now when we were walking back and we're just like i'll take her word for it like i'm a little scared but i'll take her word she was very convincing so you know all of us just decided to stay outside the city wall for like an hour and then we went back and someone just like blood all over the ground someone got stabbed right in front of the dorm and how much longer did it take for you to bail after this? When they started shutting down transportation uh-huh. because uh, the missile strikes that were hitting buses and it was just getting like very intense. Yeah. Um, there's like a constant fear that you're going to be murdered yeah. everywhere you go. Because uh, the borders are very porous there. Yeah. And you, I mean, like in the holiest city, there was one night during Shabbat where, you know, the rules of Shabbat. Uh-uh. Uh, no electricity, no phone. You just have to be present. That's it. Got just it. present. Um, there are some strict rules. And um, I was walking through the Holy City on a Saturday, uh, Friday night. So it's Friday night. So Friday to Saturday night, no electricity, can't touch anything, no work, no showering, none of that. All wow. you can do is just like eat and be present with people. And I saw this rabbi walking on his cell phone. And I'm like, this dude's going to go blow himself up somewhere like this is a arab guy dressed as a rabbi no yeah and he was an arab guy dressed as a rabbi just like sneaking around and i'm like this is just so wild dude yeah that's like some life that is a a part of your story that i did not expect so i would like sneak off to this bagel shop where they had wi-fi and i would just download like so much porn And (laughs) I would keep it on my phone because I'd be like, how do I, like, I'm not meeting any women. I'm with all these dudes all the time. Everyone's trying to tell me what to do with my life. Yeah. You know, everyone's telling you, like, in religion, they tell you what to do. Yeah. And I'm an adult. Like, I I don't like to be told what to do. Like, I can have counter arguments. Because you're what age at this point? 26. Okay, yeah, you're an adult. Yeah. Yeah. So then I would just sneak off into the shivas. I'd be, like, in temple and sneak off to the bathroom and just start, like, Watching oh porn. Oh my God. This is the craziest story. I love this. <laughs> yeah. So then I was like, maybe, maybe, I, maybe this isn't for me. Maybe I don't fit in maybe as much as I thought I did. Yeah. <laughs> Holy fuck. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then you come back to LA directly? So I came back to LA. I also had a beard and I looked like a Muslim with okay. this beard and the shaved head. Yeah. So I was getting stopped a lot. A really? Lot. Like, so that's a real thing. Like you'll get profiled. Oh, I was taken off of a bus. And these two guys who were in plain clothes, security guards, the yeah. uh, police, yeah. they made me lift my shirt up and they thought it was an Arab. I, there's a whole side of the airport in, in Israel yeah. where if you're like a suspected something, they put you through and there's cameras on you. And I had to go through this section because they all thought it was an Arab. 
Whoa. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Okay, so you're back in LA. You have your big crazy beard. You're getting profiled like a motherfucker. Right. And I come back. I shave the beard. And I'm like, what am I going to do with my life? Here you are, square one. Here I am, right back to the same spot. Learned a lot about the world, but learned that it wasn't for me. And got some really great perspective, but realized how applicable is living in a set of rules. Yeah. You know, how applicable really is saying it's a give and take, like a very dependent relationship. So it's, if I do this, this thing good happens. If I do that, then I do that. If I go by the rules and abide by the rules, then good things happen. And then good things don't happen. You're like, why did I did the rules? Why didn't good things happen? That yeah. was the idea. And if my perspective, was, my perspective was like, if I'm coming into it looking to control my reality, I'm doing it for the whole wrong reason. Like that's not why to do Judaism. You know, you're not doing it for karma. You're not doing it to, it's the ideas that mind perspective and to believe, right? So, you know, administer a belief and it just wasn't working for me. And I saw like the greed coming in for me where I'm like, I just want to make my control my life and make yeah. happiness come. And so you kind of had to like self check yourself. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, this is not working for me. So came back to LA. I was so lost and I started, oh, I went to UCLA. So I, I enrolled in the um, extension program. Oh, okay. So I really wanted to like, I'm like, I have all these, I have this energy to do and to build and to build and want to build and to keep telling stories because that's my aha moment was with screenwriting is that I love telling stories. Cool. And that was the thing, but I never knew how to find a way to make it actuate. Mm -hmm. But also with like the Jewish New Jersey energy where I'm like, I just got to go, got to go. Let's do it. Do it. Let's do it now. Let's do it now. Faster, faster. Do it. Talk fast. You know, and writing was just too slow for me. Yeah. Um, so I went to UCLA. Uh, and classes were like super cheap. So I was like, I'm going to take all these business classes. So I just like piled on business classes. So just like tried to take a whole four years worth of, uh, like, um, they call it like an entrepreneurial certificate. Mm -hmm. I did it in two semesters. So I just did like tons of classes, filled up all my time, like, just ran through savings. Like, I'm going to do this. Yeah. Um, so then when I finished, I started my first company and it was, out of pure love and it was a charity company so you give a dollar a day to a new charity each week and i took like six months to find the right charities sign them on and they would raise for something that they needed like something specific so if it was like pencils for promise they would raise for we need 100 pencils right so and you would be giving a dollar a day and then you'd be able to track did they get to those 100 pencils because everyone does it together so it's like this amount okay, of so giving like Almost like a GoFundMe of charities in a way. In like an autopilot way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And then I had 45 charities signed up. Whoa. It was, you know, it took six months and a lot of on the ground, like hustle, 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 get these charities, get them on board on this platform, build out this platform, build the technology. I taught myself how to code. So I went on Udemy and started teaching myself like coding. So I would take coding classes in the morning. So I built this website and it was clunky, but it worked. And right when we launched, within the first hour and a half, I get a call from the bank. And they said, your account got flagged. We can't allow you to be part of our bank anymore. And I'm like, why? And this is something no one ever told me, which is, it's exactly the way that you would clean money, which is you take small amounts of money from a bunch of different resources, you put it into an account, and then you separate because that account then goes to a charity. Or that account and then it spreads out so it's just kind of like fanning coming together and fanning again so they cut me out and then no bank would take me after that so i was like that's it game over on that one bro i wasn't ready for that right, <laughs> right? like you're telling me this and i'm like that is something that you should tell somebody i wish like anybody could have given you a heads up before somebody that told me even the bank that was that, that originally I, took your business just, yeah Holy shit, dude. And I'm like, square one. What am I going to do? Your story. Oh, my God. So then um, I met this really incredible friend of a friend when I was in New York. Um, introduced me to her ex-boyfriend at the time yeah. in New York. When I was in New York, here in LA. Mm -hmm. So I met this, this guy. And then through another friend, I met this other girl. And she had this great idea. And her name was Ashley's name was Ryan. 
this is a great idea. And I'm like, this is a great idea. I'm going to do this. Like, let's fucking do this. And the idea was, I was so mad that trying to do good. And I felt like still with the kind of like Jewish mentality, like my give and take mentality, that kind of like dependent mentality. I was like, oh, I'm doing something good for the world. Good should come to me. Mm -hmm. Right. That expectation, that very childish expectation. Yeah. Uh, Like forcing karma. Like forcing karma, saying like, oh, I'm going to do this. So I was like, fuck it. I went the opposite. Mm. Um, and the theme that you're noticing is I just go in a hundred percent. Yeah. Something. You're teaching yourself how to code all like, these things. Figure yeah. it out. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, fuck it. I'm going to do the evil thing. So she's like, let's start a celebrity stock market. So we started an application and mobile app at the time when mobile apps were also like very popular. So it was a celebrity stock market. So we curated entertainment news and you voted for like a celebrity more or less yeah. and it created a stock value and then you traded on the values. And then that's when I started seeing the power of data play oh. and like sentiment analysis. So it was venture backed. Um, we had a team of 16 people. It was growing and I was running it. Um, and I loved it, man. I was so, I loved the functional mechanics of building a company. Mm-hmm. I hated the application itself. Like it was fucking evil. Yeah. But I loved you know, like talking to CNN and TMZ and getting into all of these very high level meetings that I was never in before. Yeah. Um, and, you know, people being very interested in our platform and what we were building before there was even something to show, you know, like a lot of value there. Yeah. Um, and then I got Zuckerberg. They all kicked me out at the like nine months into it. We were about to launch and we had a very toxic investor. He was a um, he started playing everybody against each other. So he would take them out to dinner separately and be like, you know, Dave's kind of weak. You should take his role. I'll make sure you take his uh, role. Uh, he did that with everybody. Uh, Played everybody against themselves, uh, against each other. This mm-hmm. guy was fucking evil, man, evil. Dude, um, it's rare, but those people will present themselves in life and fucking run. Like, But I'm like grateful because I would have been miserable. Yeah, fair, true. Miserable. Silver lining for sure. Yeah, like surrounding myself with celebrity news all day, like that would make me fucking miserable. Yeah. Um. So I just got a call and they, they were all on the phone and they're like, we are going to remove you from this company. We're going to buy out your existing shares. They're all going to immediately vest and thank you and um, sign all these papers that you're not going to sue us. So I honestly was just like, okay. I was <laughs> you're just like, yeah. I was yeah. so over it at that point too. I was like, okay, fine. Okay. Yeah. Because it's like celebrity news. It's trash. It was like, so bottom of yeah. the barrel. Like, yeah, yeah. You could feel it. You liked the chase of business. You liked the meetings, but the actual pulp of it, you're just like, right. I'm like, I'm not even reading this. I don't give a shit what yeah. happened to Kylie Jenner and that everyone hates her because she had a bird fly into her window. Right. Like, right. Yeah, it was you just don't. It, it was so trivial. It was so trivial and it was okay. so unnecessary. So I bugged out because yeah. I'm like, what am I going to do now? My yeah, first, dog, again. <laughs> holy my first shit. company tanked. The second company, I'm gone. I have a little bit of savings left. What am I going to do? So I said, I don't want to be alone. That's my first thing is do not be alone. Like, David, do not be alone. I was like, I need to take care of myself. So um, my buddy, David Gorelick, also named David, um, incredible human being, the nicest human being. And you, you, you guys are like so tied with being like the nicest human beings in the world. <laughs> He's like... I want to be an actor. I want to live in LA. So he lives, he comes to my place and he lives in, I just carve out like a room for him. Yeah. And he stays. Um, so now I'm not alone. Yeah. And he's teaching me a lot of like going out and very social. So he's teaching me a lot of like people skills. And, um, and then I start this, he introduced me. So David introduces me to one of his friends who was in tech. Cause I was freaking out. I'm like, what am I going to do with my life? I would go outside and just read all day. And I was like, Dude. Yeah. Like, Dude. What, yeah. What am I going to do? Like, I can't relax. Like, yeah. I can't do it. Um, so it's pressure and pressure and pressure. And um, I met this guy and he was like, let's do an Instagram modeling agency. Okay. And, Relevant. Yeah. And so I'm like, I like, I like, bit, excuse me. I like women. Like, let's yeah. do this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Very, very fratty of you. Your oh Arizona roots coming back. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, let's yeah. fucking do this. So, we build out this company yeah. with representing Instagram models and brands and putting them together. And these two incredible, um, these hippies drive over from New Jersey, met them on Instagram through the company. And they're like, we don't know where to stay, but we want to shoot and model for you guys. 
So they pitched a tent on my roof and lived on my roof. And I had this little like kind of commune happening in the house. You have done everything. <laughs> <laughs> I give up. You've done it all. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like really, really nice to not be alone. And David Gorelick would do the cleaning and these like uh, Santi and Alyssa were their names. They yeah. would just hang out and they were very spiritual and very open and they were younger. Um, they were like 21. Nine, uh, he was 19. She was 21. Um, and they were just always creative and they had, they were free. They had, there was like this oh, reality of freedom to them. There was no boundaries. Just yeah. living on a roof. It was probably a refreshing energy for you after all the other stuff you had been through. Yeah. 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 And then I was like, no more porn. I'm going to do it for real. Uh-huh. So then D would take me out every night and I was just like, Back to Arizona days, like just oh, doing a whole yeah. lot of trying to just meet people, meet women meet in people. person. Yeah. 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 And it was wonderful until they came back to the house and saw that there was like a whole hippies living on your roof yeah, and a scenario. I, you'd be surprised how many people were like, okay, let's do this. There's no doors <laughs> in the house, too. It's just a big open, like lofty <laughs> space. Are you sure that your life isn't just the movie? Like, are you sure that this isn't the full circle thing where in the end of all of this, you tell me, you're like, so this is the movie script that I'm pitching. This is actually the whole script. Yeah. <laughs> the movie comes out next year. Just got greenlit. <laughs> Holy shit. So we built out this company mm-hmm. and um, we, in like three months, we had 300,000 followers on Instagram. Like we were going big really big, really fast. And this guy's ego couldn't handle being around all these very beautiful women because mm. he was a very sheltered tech guy. Oh, So we both co-financed it. Uh-huh. And when, when like it got too overwhelming for him and too much ego came in and it became the enemy of his, and this was right when Trump started running. So for presidents 2016. Yeah. So he started using a lot of that aggressive language and thinking that that was power. Oh. So he'd be like, I'm going to grab her brother. So he would use the Instagram and he would harass these women. Oh, no. And I was like, this is not going. That's the worst thing you could do. It's the one worst. thing to like go out and like try to hook up. But like it's another thing to use like that power and like be mad and appropriate and like actually like creepy. Mm-hmm. Oh, no. Through a business. Oh, no. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's bad. Yeah. And he started like doing a lot of drugs and doing a lot of cocaine and um that's the la we hear about right there the it LA. is yeah. you found it yeah <laughs> hell yeah brother so i was like i was trying to shelter myself in that business and say let me start building out a fashion line for the brand okay and that's how akiva came in we were such good friends for a long time for the jewish community and then he, oh yeah and then he disappeared and went back home to um isn't he living in georgia or georgia he, yeah. yeah so he was like trying to figure his life out too and was lost and uh, i was like come to la work on this company be my saving grace yeah build out this clothing line there's capital there there's an audience there like it's women everywhere we're looking up getting like a house up in the hills to start shooting our own content like it was we were in line with arsenic so we were growing with that brand arsenic that started doing their own content okay so it's just like the heyday of snapchat and micro content and got it um so he so Akiva is Cameron. So Cameron came to um, LA, yeah. moved in, um, started staying at in the basement of, oh my God, this really famous actor. He started staying in his like dungeonous basement in no. Silver Lake. Um, That's so sick. I'm forgetting who right now. Somebody will know. Damn it, it. it was like a story that we had for so long. Ah. <laughs> and he was staying in this guy's basement and we were building out, he started building out the, the clothing line for like a CPG platform for oh, the, um, for the brand, for the modeling agency. Yeah. And the hippies were part of the whole process, living on the roof, watching everything. They were doing a lot of guiding, a lot of the like soulscape guiding where they're like, do it, do it with love, like be present and, you know, manifest. Yeah. You know, all that. Yeah. I'm so, about it. Yeah. Shouts to the hippies. I like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like this. So after the harassing like didn't stop, after mm-hmm. I, I told, asked this guy to stop and yeah. all this trash started coming back. And then he started hating on everybody around me, started hating on Cameron, started hating on the, we, we just called them the kids because we were taking care of them. Maybe yeah. it's the kids. Started hating on the kids, started hating on everybody and just like losing it. And I was like, this guy's out of control. I can't control this dude. Yeah. Like there's no mobility here. So I went to his house and said, look, Here's my complaints. Here's our agreement. Here's the where you broke the agreement. Yeah. Now either give up your 
50% of the company and minimize your 50% or buy out my 50%. So what he did is he goes into his kitchen, he gets a knife and he puts it right on the table. And I'm like, that's who I'm dealing with. That's what's happening here. This dude who likes shitty power plays that aren't real. So I'm like, you made your decision. Okay. So he bought out the 50% shares because then I got a lawyer and he got a lawyer and it was a whole thing and um, bought out the 50% shares. But we had all this clothes that Cameron designed sitting in my house that we that were about to go to print. We're a week away from printing. And for some reason, they kept getting delayed. So I come home after leaving that company and I look at the kids and I'm like, what am I going to do with my life? Like everything fell apart again. Like, what am I going to do? And Santiago's like, Cameron keeps saying, do it in good faith, act, act in good faith, act in good faith, act in good faith. And Alyssa's like, I have this image of a rose in my mind. And then she's like, rose in good faith. You should start a clothing line called Rose in good faith. Holy shit. Yeah. And I'm like, that name is clunky and sounds like shit. I'm like, well, that is trash. I'm not going to do that shit. What? Yeah. I'm like, clothing? I'm, am I really going to be in clothing? Like, I'm not a fashion guy. Like, I like functions. I like, you know, commerce and creativity come together. I like, you know, like, I don't like plastic arts, you know, like the plastic art of dance. Like, I never really got into, like, I don't get dance. I yeah. grew up in the dance community because my family had a dance studio growing up, but I never understood the art form of dance. Yeah. It seems like it's a high art that you have to know it to understand it and you can't just look at it and appreciate it. Sure. Like, um, like we can with like music and movies, like you get emotionally tied to it. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to be in the club. You can just be like, Oh, cool. This is good. Right. Like, yeah. Oh, I get, I get what they're doing. I get it. Right. Yeah. Like dance always gets me a little, tr you know, tripped up and fashion did it for a long time too. And oh, whoa. I, I understood men's suiting. So when I was in college, I focused on men's suiting and tailoring. Uh -huh. So a lot more formal wear. Yeah. But when coming to, and I was like, I'm not going to do formal wear because that industry is not a booming industry. No. There's, who's going to give me money to start a clothing line with suits? You're like, no, no, no. Um, so we started this brand. The next day came, I woke up and I'm like, fuck it, Cam, let's do it. Let's yeah. just start a clothing brand. So we just did it. We just called the printer. I was like, stop the printing, stop the presses. I'm going to send you new artwork. And they're like, you got to send it now. Oh my God. Yeah. So, <laughs> you're, oh my God. You're good. You're good. Okay. You're good. Um, so we started doing this. So I just like, found roses and then I wrote good faith and started writing all this stuff. Right. And like, yeah. it was t-shirts. They were like these amazing t-shirts that can design and source. And they were incredible. Yeah. Um, so we printed them. Yeah. And I had a connection of a friend through the Jewish community. His yeah. name is Chris Applebaum. Okay. If you know Chris Applebaum. I don't. Should I, I again, I don't know as much in fashion, but please. Not fashion. Oh, he did the Wrecking Ball music video. Oh. He did the Fountains of Wayne music video. Oh, shit. All the Carl's Jr. ads with like oh. girls, sexy chicks, like, oh, slap each other's yeah, asses, yeah. eating food. That's, That's that guy. Is Yeah. Oh. And we became friends with him um, during the, uh, the, the original company I was going to say right. during the modeling agency and I became friends with Dove Cherney at the time that's when American Apparel was going down so I became oh. friends with them too during the Jewish community through the Jewish community again um, so I call Chris Applebaum and I'm like just be our creative director come do this so he's like fuck yeah cool. don't have to say twice so he's like here's what we're going to do so we got these photos of Tr Donald Trump's face yeah because it's still during like he was during his election time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we had a rose in his mouth, yeah. and you can still find it on the internet. And it was um, embroidered on his mouth. And he got Miley Cyrus on board to do this project and backed out last minute. And oh. it was, we were going to have models that we knew from the last company yeah. paint their ass and sit on his face. Uh -huh. So we were going to do it like, we were going to call it a pussy print or like ass sitting and then sell Holy the shirts. Holy shit. And we had a whole, man, it was a whole thing built out. It was ready to go. And then she came, she bailed and Apple Bomb bailed. And then, the location we had got like a death threat and they were like, we're not going to do this. We can't do this. So we ultimately didn't do that project, but that would have been big. would have been fun. Damn. Yeah. Whoa. So you got some crazy people involved right out the rip. Yeah. There were some really good people who believed in the vision that yeah. we had. You know, like there was a lot of passion, still is a lot of passion behind the vision, which is it took me a long time to find it. Fashion storytelling like any other media. Yeah. You just have to know how to speak the language. 
Yeah. You know? So damn, that's so nuts that that's how it all starts. And like, <laughs> wow, what a fucking journey <laughs> yeah. to get there. Yeah. Okay. So, the, but like, here's my thing is how old is the brand right now? Yeah. Three years, three years old. That is a relatively young brand to have had the success and cultural impact and, and be where it's at so early. Right. And what I'm so curious of is like, you answered a little bit of it, but like, how did it just go so crazy so fast? Like, was it you just being plugged up and getting like celebrities to wear it? Or like, how does it, like, what are the early days into like yeah. it catching fire? I looked at how did I make my first career start, yeah. which was find a way in. Everyone's going through one door, find the way into another door. And if everyone is going through the same channel, try to find another channel because you may have more success that way. Like when I did when I was writing is that I called and said I was a lawyer. I started a law firm. Yeah. So now it's solicited <laughs> material, so right? Um, which totally now would not fly. That was the time it did. But <laughs> um, I looked back at that and said, I got to be relentless in the pursuit of what I want and how to get there and be relentless in reaching out and finding who the right people are and being genuine and honest with them and just being present and that knowing that all all it is is just consistency just be present be there and just ask and when i'm just relentlessly asking and finding the email and finding the contact and going on instagram and finding people of people of people of people that connect me up a chain it was just like this is who i need to get in touch with how do i get in touch with them yeah and it was just calling and emailing and calling and emailing and the one thing even with this whole company is that nothing happened by itself. So I did all the PR, all the press. Um, Akiva did all the designing for the first three years. Yeah. I did all of the nuts and bolts, the manufacturing, all the finding the suppliers, anything that you saw with the company, yeah. the social media, the photo, like actual like organizing the photos, editing, like anything, the copy, every little touch point in this company I, I put my hands on and did. Damn. And I had to be fucking relentless in finding the people that'll get you to the next stage. And when they say no, finding another way to turn that no into a yes. Um, and just emailing, 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 and finding the stylists and then emailing the stylists and then saying, this is what we have. And this, this is that. And this is that. And it was just like, nothing came to us. So correct me if I'm wrong, but like, this wasn't like a, a DIY project. This was you having been in so many, like all of your failures and all, or not even failures, but all of your past endeavors, all of these other things you built, you learned how to look for other doors. You learned how to put the end goal there and reverse engineer from there. You learned all these things. You met all these people in good positions. Mm -hmm. So then when you're like, this is a brand, it's going to be this fashion brand. It's going to look like this. And it's going to be the pinnacle is this. You weren't so much like making clothing from this like passionate artist spot. Like, yeah, granted, Akiva had this, like, honestly, his vision was sick. Mm -hmm. But you were just a master at reverse engineering and executing. And every spot you needed that to come in, you were just like, cool, let's go. And finding the right people, like the best people for that. Thank you for saying. Is that, like, am I understanding this right? Yeah, it was like my saying was always like, just be like water and flow like water. And that no matter if there's a wall, you just try to flow around it. And I'm, Bruce Lee, I think, said that, right? And it's always about flowing and um, yeah, finding the way to make it work because it's all on you. And no one's going to help you. Yeah. And no one's going to be there. Yeah. And if it's a problem, it's on me. And I have a very high standard of quality and a very yeah. high standard knowing that if I want to build a company that as at a certain level, I have to function at that level. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, that I fucking love that. So, okay. Th the thing about the brand though is it is not your traditional line. Like it is very bespoke pieces. Like, I mean, you'll do runs as limited as what? Like how many pieces? God, sometimes we do like two. Yeah. Like damn. Yeah. And the material, like legit, like the materials, the, the, you'll gauge clothing. You'll do all this crazy, it's past cutting. So it's, it, it's, ridiculous right it's like you're building a car out of a clothing the things that you put into it where did that come from right because if you said that you weren't that deep into fashion or you know like you knew like men's suiting like 
where was where did the part of the brand where something as unique as that concept and that level of quality come from? So when I was in UCLA, I yeah. took this class called Blue Ocean Strategy. Uh-huh. And there's this one phrase that always stuck with me, which was be exceptionally useful when compared to the alternatives. And it was the basis of all good business was if you can be exceptionally useful when compared to the alternatives, you'll win. If you're on a wall and you're making coconut water and there's a wall of other coconut waters, how are you exceptionally useful when compared to all the rest? So looking at this flat world of fashion is that it is purely emotional. It is an emotionally driven medium. It is not, there's no use. It's not a scarce resource. There is always fashion. There's always cheaper fashion. There's always more immediate fashion. And Akiva and I sat down together and we said like, where, where do we connect? Where do we click? Where can he take his concepts of being Mr. Bonus is what they used to call him in college. Cause he'd always be like, I want that. And that, you know, how do we bring that <laughs> together? <Bonus>. Yeah. <laughs> if he's watching this, he hates me right now, but if he's watching this, he would laugh at <laughs> the Mr. Mr. Bonus. bonus what up? Shouts. Yeah. Um, um, and I'll mention later why he hates me so much now, but I'll mention it later. Um, um, so yeah, it was, us coming together and saying like, how do we become exceptionally useful when compared to the alternatives? And I'm looking around, I'm like, just go to every fucking fabric shop. You can figure out the best way to do it. Yeah. Figure out the rare fabrics. Yeah. Find a target that you want to hit. Yeah. See what they're doing. Mirror them until you get your, you know, you can start, you learn from them, learn from what they did. And yeah. you know, when I was writing, it was the same thing. It was, I would look at other scripts and I would say, here's my story. Yeah. I'm going to put it into the structure of blow yeah. the movie blow. So I took a script and I did it in the structure of blow as my own story. And that wow. taught me everything because you also have to learn Dude. like storytelling timing. I'm really learning like a, like something that I'm taking away from this that I love is like you were comparing to such exceptional examples and then reverse engineering. And that's so wildly interesting and simple to me. But that's crazy. That's cool. What were, out of curiosity, what were some of the first brands and people that were doing it so well that you were comparing to? Like when you were like being like, yo, these people are killing it. What were yeah. some of the first? Well, we came in at the heyday of fashion streetwear explosion. Mm -hmm. 2017 was mm. the peak of the influencer. It was the peak of streetwear coming into the fashion set. It was all this old guard falling apart and all this new guard coming in. Very true. That was this like crazy year where if Kanye Bieber or any handful of people wore something, yeah. your brand is still using images from 2017 on when they wore that and have been exploding ever since. Yeah. Carhu is a, is a shoe brand that was dead. Nobody knew it. It's Australian. I don't know what that is. Shoe. Yeah. Kanye wore it once in 2017. The company is now everywhere. Still riding off that. Holy. It's still moving, you know, and that was the era of like Vetma of oh. Off White starting to come out. Yeah, and like Amiri. These are all these brands that like are so advanced now, but yeah. they were they were in 2017 very micro, very small. Right. So it was these brands, like you just said, that were getting worn by these massive celebrities and just creating these booms. Booms. Yeah. Yeah. Like okay. Vetma was always my target. I would look mm -hmm. at what Vetma did. Is yeah. they would take a subculture that was near and dear to them. Yep. They would take a shape that you would expect and twist it a little bit. Yep. Kind of like what we were talking about earlier, which is like a story we were saying about the other podcast where it's like, hey, let's talk about jazz. But then let me just, yeah, let, yeah, by yeah, the yeah, way, yeah, like, yeah. there's aliens. This, this is actually a podcast yeah. about aliens. By the way, there's aliens yeah, now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so it was like, it's taking that logic and applying wow. that. Wow. That's really interesting to me. So, okay. So then with that, your brand has had massive celebrities wear it. And with you explaining all these pieces, I can't help but feel like you were maybe a piece of them getting their hands on some of that. How, like, what was your first celebrity? Like, what was the first moment where it was like, oh shit, this person is wearing this? Or like, how does that happen? Because I've, ne like, there are certain brands that will never have that happen. Yeah. The first one was, um, I had a friend that was a stylist. And at the time I was dating a stylist. So cool. she also had a lot of friends in the community yeah um there's these two guys called jack and jack okay they're youtube 
guys. They're like okay. comedians. And Sometimes I feel bad because like there's things that I like there's certain cultural things where I'm like, I totally know that. And then yeah. like other things where I'm like, oh yeah, go on. No, that that's <laughs> I saw the Coachella lineup and I was like, okay, Coachella, go on. Like, who are all these people? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Explain. <laughs> Explain. Um Jack and Jack wore our music, wore our clothes the entire music video since music video and it had like a million views overnight. Okay. It did nothing for us oh. other than uh, me saying like that's the first time our clothes got worn and got worn like with presents. Yeah. And then it started moving a little bit because they were a small subset of a community of a community. I mean, those are like teenagers that love Jack and Jack. Yeah. 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 And YouTube. Kind of like, uh, like I remember I had a friend that had pretty good success because back in the day, One Direction wore a piece of her brand and yeah. it was like a year of her just being like, shit's sick. I'm buying a Jeep. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So <laughs> Jack and Jack. So Jack and Jack. And then? Haley Bieber, when she was still Haley Baldwin, oh. wore this Sherpa that we had. Um, we took it to Paris because we were still trying to figure out what are we going to do? This is the first year of functioning. We're like, how do we maneuver in a world? We don't know. We're outsiders. And we came in with a strong vision of music culture. Yes. And music subculture and like yes. post hardcore music culture. The yes. Stuff that Akiva grew up on and I grew up on. That mm -hmm. Mine was a little bit grungier than his, but it came together. Actually, since this is a music podcast, what were yeah. some of the artists that you were listening to? Like, what were some of the, the OGs? Dude, like, since I grew up in New Jersey, yeah. there was this one girl, Carolina Montalvo, who I always wanted to make out with when I was a teenager. <laughs> so, uh, Carolina, what's up? Shout, yeah, shout out Carolina if you're still. Uh, I haven't seen hey, her. Girl. Still single. Hit me up. <laughs> <laughs> she, we would just jump in her Chrysler and go to the city, and she would just take me to shows. Damn. And I see some wild shows, man. I saw like Ted Leo and the Pharmacists. Okay. And throw out like random names. Yeah. Please. Coheed and Cambria. Oh my god, like huge. Yeah. Um, my first concert I ever went to was Taking Back Sunday at Six Flags. Holy, dude. Jersey, so Jersey. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Loved it. That's Loved crazy. It. Yeah. Wow. Dude, just like all the time going to all these like little grungy shows in um, like the middle of nowhere, Manhattan. She would just take me and be like, let's go see this, these people. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Like a lot of people that I've talked to, like, it's like, it's, it's fun. There's been like a girl. It's like, oh, I was crushing on this girl. She showed me the CD, whatever. And then like to her, she's just casually like, yeah, I like this. And then like, you're like, wait a minute, I'm obsessed. What's this whole subculture? And you're like, in. Right. I right. definitely found so much of that, like through this one girl that just showed me so much music. And I was like, this is amazing. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. That's really cool. I have a lot of ties to those artists too that you said. So that's really cool really? to hear. But I really want to hear more about the brand. So mm -hmm. you were taking it to Paris and you were like, yo, let's double down on our influence of post hardcore, but like just like our initial roots in music. Yeah. 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 And let's double down and let's take whatever capital we have. Let's yeah. build out samples. Let's try to find what's working. Let's do a full cut and sew line. And it was just asking friends of friends, like, do you know someone who can do this? Do you know someone yeah. who can do this? So we did this big Sherpa hoodie and I had this vision of a big fluffy Sherpa hoodie yeah. and I couldn't find this Sherpa anywhere because yeah. it's really hard to find a very specific fluffy Sherpa that isn't synthetic because it's a synthetic material. Mm -hmm. So I went to Costco and found these blankets and we cut out these blankets and this guy put these hoodies together a friend of ours, friend of friend, put them together. And there are these double li layered Sherpa hoodies. They're just like big, bold, and fucking incredible. Yeah. And we were in Paris with a few friends and met a bunch of people. And uh, I think we met Haley Bieber's Baldwin stylist at that point. Yeah. And came back and um, it was pulled. And then Halsey wore it too. Oh. And then Haley wore it. Halsey wore it. And then Halsey smoked in it. So I was like, Maeve is her stylist. So I was like, you gotta buy this. Yeah. Buy this now. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's when we did our first pop up right after that with Emo Night at AMRAG, at American Rag. No way. We had a whole window display. So your Emo Night collab was like early days. It's like that post hardcore. It's like the OG post hardcore, like oozing, like uh, mm. goo hardcore like shirt. Graves. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Dude, yeah, I didn't realize that was that early in 2018. Okay, yeah, that's when they were like starting to really pop. Yeah, yeah, Babs yeah. was just on the podcast, so I love like shout out Babs, dude. She's shouts to her, yeah. and it, it's so cool. Like, 
for me, like I've had a feeling of being the outsider looking in. And like, as I start to do this podcast and talk to people and hear these stories, like learning that there's this community of people and everybody knows these people. And it's just yeah. a bunch of people trying their best and trying to do what they believe in. Like, I love hearing these worlds tie together. Yeah. It's so incredible to me. Yeah. So early on, Halsey wears it. And then you do your American rag. In the window. My, yeah. yeah. We do this concert venue bathroom in the window of American rag. Yeah. And little Aaron. Plays, yo. Yo. This is like 2018. Little Aaron plays uh, the, the. So it's Princess Gollum, little Aaron. And a bunch of people who I didn't know at the time just started like getting to know. So like Bradley Sol Sol Solieu, Solier, like uh -huh. an amazing, amazing human being, this Black Fist label and was like in all these Lana Del Rey music videos and great guy. He was DJing, like all these people I didn't know yeah. coming together for this pop-up event yeah. to come to this store. And to this day, they said it was the most um, successful pop-up they've ever had. The most people have ever shown up. Dude. That's so cool. I love little Aaron too. He, yeah. Dude, he is the most plugged up, like low key. I didn't know you knew him. That's amazing. I didn't know he was a part of that. <laughs> that makes my day. I love him so much. Yeah. Damn. So that was like massive. Yeah. So I, I imagine then, so it's like you're going to fashion. That was fashion week in Paris? It's fashion week. Yeah. You're going there. You have the vision of this like unique piece. You get it done. Real celebrities wear it. You're doing this pop up. like. That feels like traction at this traction point. Yeah. Started, right? And I do what I do best, which is I find creative avenues to get everyone's email address mm -hmm. and email everybody. So this is how I started really getting a lot of the press. Yeah. So I have some ways of backtracking how to get people's email addresses. And I would assume like, dude, you've it, this is where you doing and trying everything comes to your advantage. Like if you've done yeah. all these companies, if you've tried all these things, as far as like business savvy, like here's what I need to figure out. You probably have all the experience in the world. So there's this thing called like mail merge and email tracking. Uh -huh. So what I do is I go on LinkedIn yeah. and I have this system that can, you have to sign up with an email address on LinkedIn yeah. to create an account. Yeah. So it goes through LinkedIn and it gets your personal email address oh. and it scrolls the internet and finds if you've listed any other email addresses, oh. sometimes even your phone number. Holy. So I have all of your information. I, I'll get a lot of information. And then I find who's the relevant person. So I'll go through WWD and who's writing about our topics. Go through and be like, who's writing about us? So I create a spreadsheet and I write who the person is, what they wrote about, and um, what's their name, right? And then I would do this mass email that took maybe 20 minutes to go out at most. It would be 800 people. And it would look personal because it would say like, I love that you did this story about this, 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 this. Here's what we're doing. It's, you know, I'm very good at like this. AIDA emails, which is attention, interest, desire, action, which is like very yeah. fast how to get things moving. And I would just email out get everyone and do it constantly. So I'd see email tracker. Someone opened it twice. Maybe there's interest. Maybe they clicked. So I email them again. I'd say, hey, just following up. And I would just keep pinging until someone said, okay, let's do something. And that's how almost every, cl every collaboration happened was through that action of just emailing email email be relentless in your pursuit of what you want that constantly doing 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 I'm take it to take take the tools fucking blown away dude, because <laughs> i think that that's what it takes i think that anybody that expects great success and all that it's like i i it's this weird thing, right? If you follow the rules, I don't know if you're necessarily going to win. Like if you think if you just stay inside the box and do the typical, the standard, I don't know if you win. But hearing you say this, it's just like, here's the end goal. How are we getting there? Right. And like that relentless, just like, cool, like maybe this is a little creepy or whatever, but it's like, here are tools. Here are tools and here is something that I fucking believe in. Right. I'm going for it. Yeah. Like that to me, I think that lesson is remarkable. And I, I think that like you have to be insanely creative, right? Because when you get into that kind of finesse, y y there isn't a playbook to it. Right. But it has to just be whatever that skill is that you've picked up along the years of like, here's my vision and here's this, take that idea, take that. And that's amazing. Yeah. Matched with education now because you've had all of this education. So now you have this finesse and then you're like, okay, cool. Explain that email to me again, yeah. actually, because I think that that's something to touch on. Yeah. The way you structured an email. Yeah. I mean, the one thing about 
UCLA brought that gave to me what I really wanted was a foundation. Sometimes I don't have an answer to how to do something, and I sometimes the foundation just makes it streamlined. So I I they talked about this AIDA. It was in a marketing class. It was um, attention, so something to get their attention, interest, something to poke at their interest, desire, something to create desire, and then something to create action. So it's just kind of like each one is its own paragraph, not more than two and a half, three sentences. Yeah. And then AIDA, each one's very tailor made. And it's again, it goes back to writing and storytelling. So you have to tell a story and you have to say like, I love that you did this. Let me tell you about this thing I'm doing. We just had a pop up at this store. I uh, and then D would be like, here's this new project we're going, we're doing. We'd love coverage. Are you free for a call noon on Tuesday? Now we just force times and calendar. So yeah. Even just send a calendar. Right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you leave it to them, if you say, when are you open or whatever, like you take out all the variables, just like, here's this, yeah, dude, that's, that's something that, um, I don't know how to do this with the podcast. Like I, I'm probably evolve it more, but like, I love to hear your story because it, it gives me this full understanding of why this has come to be and the person behind it. But I think that there's also an insane amount of value in very specific topics, right? And like things like that, like we could probably spend an hour talking about how to properly reach out and send emails. And that's important. Yeah. So that's like, I try to balance the two in this, but I always right. feel like I'm racing for time. And maybe I'm going to have to just do start doing part twos with guests <laughs> yeah. where it's like, all right, you're a brilliant person with I'm this. Waiting. Come talk to yeah. me about this. But yeah. that that one spot is amazing. So you're getting this traction, you're a mastermind with reaching out to people and that is starting to work where you're able to get these meetings, these calls, these collabs. Right. And then we get the Ed Hardy collab and we, um, this is all Akiva finagled his way into getting a, um, a consulting agreement with Iconics and they gave us a lot of money for it to help revamp the Ed Hardy for the other licensees. Oh. So, and that was enough for like an entire year for us. Oh, wow. And props to him for like thinking like that. Yeah. I wouldn't even have thought to be like that aggressive towards yeah. this publicly traded company. What did the bonus king? What was it? Mr. Bonus. Mr. Bonus. Mr. bonus. There he goes. And, and I, I like always thank him for that. Yeah. Um, and he really killed it. Um, then they sued us. What? That's where I oh, throw fuck, it like whoops. later on. <laughs> and then they tried to sue us and we lost all the money. But uh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> and that's kind of like where our relationship started to really fall apart wow. is when you're doing a business with your best friend, it's a relationship. And like all relationships, it's very easy to get into a relationship and really hard to keep a relationship thriving, happy, and without pressure and stress. Yeah. And when there's pressure and stress and survival mode kicks in. Yeah. All you think about is me, 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 me. Yeah. And when that happens, it's really hard to say, like, how do we be a progressive team, learn from our failures, yeah. figure out what's not working and do something totally differently. Yeah. And, you know, sadly, he wasn't on board with that yeah. concept. And he was on board with it, but too afraid to make some of these really big leaps of change, of just complete lean like we're tossing this entire thing out yeah we're doing this totally differently we're bringing on this and that and bringing on that and that he was just like pump the brakes no way yeah i feel like i mean again i don't i don't know him on a deep level and i don't want to front like i am but i think that that is a very hard thing of like when you're an artist and when you have a vision and when you're passionate about a vision there is times where commerce and business and the reality of what has to be done to execute is a huge fucking disappointment and it's such a bummer. And I absolutely get that. Like, again, I don't know the whole situation. I have nothing but love. Like I really respect him, but right. I can, with you saying that I can understand that. Yeah. And it got like dire. Dude, we were like barely able to eat. Like I was just able to afford rent. Oh, like fuck. we weren't selling anything after that. Mm -hmm. We were just like white. Yeah. And they try to put us out of business, which is why I, I kind of try to. Got it. Um, because we took too long to create the um, the collaboration, we took too long past the contract, and they said, "Well, your contract expired. Now you're working outside of the agreement." But it was another person who was at the company that was saying, "It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. You can go oh, further." And then they got fired, shit. so it went to somebody else. And they were just like, 
so candies. That, yeah, that was just like a turn of event. You couldn't expect that. Could yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I guess know, you could have delivered faster, but yeah. well, we convinced her to move to LA, and then she did move to LA and quit her job. Oh, the girl whoops. that was doing the Iconics project that signed us up. Yeah, Fuck. yeah. So like, we kind of <laughs> knew something was going to happen, but there's, I couldn't force. I can't force. You know, with my way of um, working with creatives or never to force my will yeah. and to have full free reign. And then the boundaries are, I'm not going to judge and qualify what the creative is because it's so subjective, but I'm just going to judge and say, what's a budget? Can we do it in this budget? Yeah. What's the delivery method? What's the execution? How are we going to do it? Yeah. And is it scalable? Yeah. And if it fits within those, I'm never going to say the words no. Sure. You know, even if I don't like it, it's not up to me. Interesting. You know? Yeah. Well, it's like, that's, well, that, okay. So this actually kind of ties into it is like, I feel like you have a very execution mind, like where it's just like, cool, can this be done? Just like you explained, the brand has so much artistic integrity. And I'm curious now, because you and Akiva did part ways, continuing on and carrying on the brand, like, dude, I've seen it, like, it, it's still going crazy, right? Like, some of the other things is like, I mean, again, like I said, the Kardashians were, yeah, well, the Kardashians wore it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um you have all of yeah, yeah i'll talk about that in a second that's incredible so like it's continued to go on you've continued to do these collabs mm -hmm. um and the brand has continued to have the same feel to it has that been a challenge for you to continue that like have you brought in a creative director like what how does that work i don't know carlos sliz who was um Ghost Main's creative director uh -huh. was helping and yeah. helping get you know my head right and was incredibly supportive after we decided to split and part ways. Yeah, um, he was really helpful in saying, you know, like you can do this and you're okay. Yeah, you're be okay. Um, and he really helped guide and find some of the right people who can see that vision through, like a graphic designer. Um, and also with me not going crazy now being alone. And yeah. in my house again, alone, being yeah. like, I need to create. And I had a girlfriend at the time. We broke up a month ago. Oh, okay. Um, but she really kept saying, constantly reaffirmed, she's like, David, you're an artist. Do everything with love. Be an artist. Do everything with love. The Whatever core. you do. Yeah, yeah. Do it with love. Yeah. And that always really stuck with me. And she hated the brand. Really? She hated violence. Funny. Hated the music. Funny. No, yeah, none of the clothes can be out in the house. Like they would be hanging and she'd be like, get that shit out of here. Yeah. She hated it. But, you know, us parting ways also showed me that I can't be codependent on somebody else's vision. Mm -hmm. And same thing with Akiva. I can't be dependent on someone else's vision to execute my own vision. Yeah. And this is really the first time in my career where I've just had to execute my own vision of what I think it looks like. Yeah. From a creative perspective. Yeah. That's wild. That, that's a really interesting to hear thing to hear. But I also, one thing that I love now that I understand your story is I feel like there's been a lot of times where there's been an impasse in like all of your endeavors and it's fallen apart. But to hear that you're just like, cool, it keeps going and all that. Like, again, I don't know what I'm assuming a little bit, but like, it feels like a level up in a new chapter of you as David to be like, cool, I'm going to keep this going. And that's really cool to me. Yeah. Well, I've also just considered doing porn. Okay, tight. Yeah, I could Sweet. just like say fuck it and just <laughs> hey, man. it's never gonna work. Um thanks, man. I really appreciate that. Yeah. 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 Uh, That's yeah. no, it's cool. And um, I mean, just talking about like a little bit of the future of the brand, like we were saying, and by the time this airs, by the, it has to be by the time this airs, mm -hmm. or else we won't be able to talk about it. But uh working with little peeps estate and doing something, um, I believe a lot of that money, all of the money is going to charity, right? Yeah, all of it. Tell me about that because that's that's really cool. He was a huge part of a very important scene. And I think that, like, again, working with very relevant people, he is such an important part of music. And it's such a, I mean, you know, I, I think that it's important. I think that's a really cool thing to do. It's an honor on both sides. It's a, it's a really interesting project. Um, it's something in 2017 when we started. Yeah. Um, we were working with a friend. Her name's Jade. Runs a showroom. Mm -hmm. Right. So she also is connected with stylists. And yeah. um, really early on, we became aware of Little Pete. Yeah. And she was like, send some stuff to him. Let's send him some stuff. Let's see if he gets in, really likes it. Yeah. And then he wore it a lot. 
he oh, wore damn. the Shibori shirt that we had made like a block away from my house, which is the office still. Yeah. Um, by this guy named Graham. There's a video on the internet you can find of him actually making Graham actually making the shirt and dyeing it with um, indigo that's grown in front of the store, like its whole thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So little people were our clothes a lot, and um, he was really our introduction to say this community is where we want to be. Yeah. In 2017, and um, I reached out to his parents, to his mom, yeah. and said after the movie came out, and I I didn't really get his life until i saw that movie everyone's everything everybody's everything and at the end i was just like crying i was like this is so sad and i was so moved by this guy's story and um so moved by just like gus's hardship and the things he had to go through and what he overcame and how he was able to communicate his sadness through his lyrics yeah and over the years a lot of his um fans have reached out to us with content of him wearing a shirt and oh. a week before he passed away uh, a fan gave us this content where he was the speaker's blue so he's this fan is in this in the crowd and this is the content we're going to use for the marketing um this guy's in the crowd and the crowd is singing with little beep because that's it the whole speakers are blowing yeah They're all singing and hung, hanging on every word and feeling every and they're saying such like heavily emotional things that feel so real yeah. And it was so moving when he sent me this content. Um, and they sung like three songs without just all doing yeah. it, you know, a cappella, like the whole crowd singing with him. Insane. Like to see how many people he touched and lives he affected. And um, I have a photo of his computer, and on his computer is a giant Greenpeace logo. And he's always loved animals and loved the world and wanted to help the world in any way possible. And I reached out to his mom and I'm like, look you don't know me we haven't met we have some mutual friends and connections but i would love to do a project what do you think about a project and re-releasing this shibori shirt that he wore and she's like look i don't know maybe maybe not you know all this and then it's hard right it's hard because it's like you want to do something like i don't even know how to speak on that right like it's right the and only thing i can say is it's hard right it's you want to do it you have the best intention right but how is that perceived and it's hard. Yeah. And I saw it as this way of like chariot of fire style and saying, fuck it. I've always wanted to do good with what I can. Yeah. And at some point this fashion becomes somewhat self-fulfilling. Yeah. Let me take this platform. Let me take what we have and do something good. Yeah. So I said, look, let's just donate it to something that means a lot to me, which is AA and NA. Um, his mom said, no, um, we don't know much about NA and AA, but let's do Greenpeace. Gus loved Greenpeace in his honor. Let's do Greenpeace. Yeah. Yeah. So that's beautiful. So we're making all the shirts downtown in our factories. Going to do like 600 tees and like 800 hoodies and donate everything, just all of it, whatever it is. Like chair to fire, man. Just like go out. And if people are going to hate the project, at least I know that I did something right. Yeah. And then after that, following it up, I have a few more projects, but. Yeah. And if they hate it, then they hate it. And at least I just, my conscience is clear because I did something that I wanted to do. Yeah. Personally. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's cool. And like, I think that I can only imagine like the pressure of like, cool, you have a culture, cultural, culturally <laughs> relevant brand uh, to be able to then like everybody's paying attention to you and they're going to scrutinize no matter what. So it's like, how do you guide that? And I think ultimately, like you have to have just your foundation and kind of follow some compass. So yeah. That's cool to me. And the last question I have as far as the brand is everything is so bespoke. Everything is so custom. So much of that. The brand, like pieces of it, there are certain pieces that are fucking expensive. Like you're going to buy a cheaper shirt almost anywhere you go. But I, I actually, I like to do my research on my people, my guests. And I saw you did a drop and it came up, I believe it came up on a certain Reddit. And, uh, Somebody actually had a really beautiful point that I liked a lot where he was like, you have to understand, maybe this brand is asking a high price for a piece, but what goes into it, like you have to factor those costs in. And something that you've continued to tell me throughout your story is like, you're sourcing such interesting pieces and you're going all over and you're growing materials and you're getting fabrics from LA and from all over and you're, you're hiring all these people. So just like... I guess like 
speaking on that and even like explaining that to me because it's such like a, I don't know that world as much, but I actually really liked that perspective of, yeah, it's more, but there's a lot more that goes into it. And I think that that's a piece of the brand that's always been like, if you're getting a piece, there's something really unique about it and you're paying for it. Like the people that are buying it know that and they want that. Am I wrong to think that that is a very important piece of the brand? Yeah, I think a lot of the narrative changed when I started showing on the Instagram the actual process of how I take the materials and bring it to production. Yeah. And I, because a lot of people say similar, they say, why is it so expensive? It's just a t-shirt. Yeah. And it's like, who created that idea that a t-shirt is supposed to be inexpensive, which is an H&M of fast fashion who said, Gee, this, this is a disposable item. Right. Right. So I, I always say, like, how do you make it a non-disposable item? You just turn it around and you say, okay, we're going to go, I'm going to go to this place downtown, find the right thread. And you're going to weave it in front of me. I'm going to get all the yarn together that's made for us to our sp- spe- specification, our, the weight that we want, the, yeah. uh, you know, do we want brushing, not brushing? Do we want it to be dry? Like so much goes into it. What is the, um, we're going to die. We're going to shrink it. You know, it. I mean, like so much goes into the decisions, right? Yeah. Um, and then I would take that material and I would go to our facility and then there would be 10 people on the line that are working their ass off, just hand sewing everything yeah. all together and cutting and sewing and doing it all by hand. Yeah. And then I would take those prepared for dye PFD garments and I would just, just standing over everybody. And then I'd take it and I'd go to the dye house and there's these three guys who just work their asses off. And they'll dye everything. And it's always a very special dye. So we'll use pigment dyes, um, which have an oil base to them versus like a more chemical dye. So it feels more natural and gets a very um, dry hand to it. Um, And we'll use very rare, specific artisanal directions that are harder to come by. So uh, a dye will have a potassium spray, which five people know how to do it and do it right um gets really tricky we did this spray with a black spray and just it's a huge mess if you don't do it right yeah um and you have to do it in sunshine at a right temperature it's like so much quality control goes into it and then we have a printer where he has this very special ink and he's this amazing guy it's just him yeah um so he will print we'll put it outside it'll be in the sun it'll start cracking yeah. Then we'll put it under UV light, bring it back in, put on UV light to cure it. And then he'd go through, he'd do another set of this plastisol crackle type ink and we put it back outside in the sun and it'll start cracking. So it has like a vintage worn in feel to it. Yeah. And then we um, do again the UV and we heat it and then I would bring it back to the dye house and then we'd put uh, some finishing on it to make the hand feel soft. A little enzyme. So it kind of like eats at all whatever's kind of like pilling or left over. Yeah. Uh, and then I bring it to another person who will just hand stitch the tags. So she just hand stitches tags. That's all she does for us all day. She's hand stitch tags. Um, and then I bring it back and I fold it in my house or I'll press if there's, um, crystals. So it's a lengthy process, especially with deconstruction. I'm like hand deconstructing it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just a shirt. Like you've it's done many pieces that are not just shirts. Yeah. I don't know that that's, that's really cool to hear for me because I think that it's easy to be a hater and be like, this is expensive and stupid, but it's like, I think that there are things in life where if you understand the culture, you understand the subculture and you understand there's always more to it. And there's always a reason why it matters. And there's always somebody behind it that's putting this care into it. And if, if that's not for you, that's fine. Go buy an H and M shirt. But I, I really actually respect that. Like, I, I feel like I had to check myself. I had to be like, I was kind of a hater on like expensive streetwear yeah. and okay, cool. So that wasn't the thing that I got deeply into, but I actually really respect it because I found so many of these insanely creative, passionate people mm-hmm. putting this care into it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it's really cool to hear that broken down. Yeah. I love that. Thank it's you. really cool. Like the one thing that being in this industry for the past three years is you start learning the insides of how things happened yeah. and how they work outside of the highlight reel. Yes. So it's really interesting when you hear a highlight reel or you read or you see an interview and you're like, this is what they, this is, they did that and that and that and it all looks great. Yeah. Then you actually hear 
how it got to where it is. Right. They always have a very different Dude, foundation. That's what I'm obsessed with. That's like, I mean, yeah. and that's why I love a podcast, right? Because you can't talk yeah. about all this in a single Forbes interview or whatever. It's like, dude, you, you, mm. it takes a certain level. And even a podcast, mm. it doesn't even scratch the surface, right? right? Like, I wish I could be a fly on the wall and just follow you for a day, but mm -hmm. a week. <laughs> like, but, if you knew how much money was behind some of these brands that yeah. look independent. Yeah. Yeah. They're not. So to be a truly independent brand in itself it is ridiculously insane. Makes no money at all. Yeah. Yeah. It like barely survives at times. Right. Um, well, then you also, you're fronting the overhead. You're paying for all of that all of to yeah. get done before it happens. It comes, all the money comes out of just through the sales of the garment. So like we don't have investors, we don't have um, a bank loan. Yeah. It's just fuck yeah damn yeah that i mean no that's really cool and I, I guess so actually again the perfect way to maybe wrap this is somebody who's listening to this they love it they love the story they're all in on fashion or maybe even they're maybe it's not fashion maybe they just relate to you being like dude i've done a billion things and i've just been trying to find myself what would your advice be now that you've experienced it all that person who is chasing their thing, be it fashion or be it just their proper outlet, right. what would a piece of advice be to somebody in that position that's looking to connect that and get there? Happiness is never the idea of what something looks like. I had to, after I turned 30, it's really, I had to redefine what happiness looks like and what happiness means. And I think happiness is progress towards something you want. And that's pure happiness. That's it. That's how it is. Progress is when you make progress. It's not this vision. It's not what it can be. It's not what it looks like or someone else doing this. So it's just if you have an idea and you make progress towards it, that's all it is. And that's happiness. That's crazy to me because I've had some very successful friends tell me something very similar. Yeah. It's like I, I you're saying that to me, and I'm like, y'all have an Illuminati code. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Y'all, that's the code. Like, yeah. but I, I mean, yeah. I get it, and I, I've, I have experienced that. But it's, it's actually really cool to hear that from yet another person that I look up to. Yeah, thanks, dude. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for having me. This you was did it. really fun, and yeah. like, I, I, ha I had a feeling you would have a good story. I wasn't ready for this, <laughs> and to <laughs> learn about an industry that I really didn't know that much about, like all of this, like I. There was so much in this. There was, I, I just like, I personally got so much out of this. So thank you for sharing that wisdom. Like this is a look inside of something that I, I hope is valuable to other people. I certainly selfishly had a great time hearing it and thank learning you. it. So thank you for the time for thank real. You. Thank you. I'll be on live Jasmine tonight under DMT 1213. Perfect. Hit him yeah. up. Hit him up. <laughs> Um, yeah, if anybody does want to find the brand or anything, I mean, it's pretty easy to find, right? Yeah. Rose and Good Faith, pretty Rose, much everywhere. Yeah, everyone always says Rose and Good Faith. Rose, Rose in Good Faith. Yes. Yeah. Cool, man. Did I miss anything? Thank you like for the opportunity. Good. I'm blessed. Thank Dog, you, this was amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.